Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 2023 Docklands Documentary Film Festival. My name is Michelle Svensson, and I have the privilege to be part of a wonderful programming team and with the California Film Institute staff. Uh, before we begin today, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the land, uh, the tribes whose land we stand on today. The California Film Institute sits on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary homelands of the Coast Miwok, the Pomo, and the Wapos people, which include the Southern Pomo and Grand Town Rancheria tribes. <laughs> Docklands is proud to have an outstanding network of community partners. We would like to thank the partners for tonight's screening who've helped bring awareness to today. Uh, the American Indian Film Institute, the Marin Alliance, Marin American Indian Alliance, and Alliance for Felix Cove. So thank you. We would also like to give a very special thank you to tonight's film screening sponsor, T Wolf. Without the support of sponsors like you, our donors and members, none of this would be possible. Also, for some housekeeping, you might have received a red and white ballot earlier today. That's your opportunity to vote for your favorite film at this year's Docklands. So after the screening, there will be volunteers outside collecting your votes. Don't forget to vote. Now about tonight's film. When I first saw this film, I was mesmerized from the beginning to the very end. Um, it did recall to me some books I had read when I was younger, but what really kind of blew me away about this film was its perspective and its authentic truth. Not only does this film talk about perseverance for truth and justice, but it also reminds us to support stories made by those whose stories they belong to. For when we do that, we empower people with agency and control of their own narrative. And when we do that, that's when we can truly learn. And for, by learning, we can actually take action. And we also have a very um, special guest who will be moderating tonight. So after the screening, Cherokee journalist and Native American free press advocate, Brian Pollard, will help moderate the screening with um, one of the co-directors, Jesse Schwarbel, who's here in the theater today, and executive producer, Sarah Eaglehart. Um, but before that, Jesse is going to say a few words to welcome you. And I just want to remind everybody to please turn off your cell phone ringers. Um Petu Washte, uh Jesse Shortbo, Imanchiapiello, uh Mini Wancha Week Chakpi Imanchiapiello. Thank you everybody for coming out and uh, supporting the film today. And I uh, really hope you enjoy it. And um with that, uh, enjoy the show. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to share this film with you all and um, to introduce our moderator. Uh, Brian Pollard is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. He served as executive director of the Cherokee Phoenix, advocating for press protections and drafting revisions of the Indep Independent Press Act. As former associate director and president of the Native American uh, Journalists Association, he developed programs in empowering indigenous voices and conducted research on press freedom. Bryant Lee currently serves on the Society of Professional Journalists Freedom of Information Committee, the Board of Directors for High Country News, and Street Roots. He is the Grant Operations Manager at the Associated Press, overseeing philanthropic initiatives. Brian. Thank you, Michelle. What a great film. Let's hear it for this film. Great. Yeah. It's my great honor to introduce two people behind this film. Jesse Shortbull is a proud member of the Oglala Lakota Nation, living near the Badlands of South Dakota. Jesse has been involved with his community since 2005, when he became an active tribal college student. Since then, he has helped create the Native Youth Leadership Alliance, 
to assist tribal college students with their goals. Additionally, Jesse has served the Oglata, Oglala Sioux Tribe President's Office for two years. Inspired by his great-grandmother, Kate Rubidoux Blue Thunder, an oral Lakota storyteller, Jesse has kept his passion for stories alive through writing and filmmaking. Jesse, come on up. Sarah Eaglehart is an Oglala Lakota Emmy Award-winning social justice storyteller, entrepreneur, and philanthropic leader. Ms. Eaglehart recently co-founded Zoya Entertainment to share stories of culture, healing, and indigenous worldview. Her new book, Warrior Princesses Strike Back, How Lakota Twins Fight Oppression and Heal Through Connectedness, was co-authored with psychotherapist Emma Hart Emma Eaglehart White, published by Feminist Press in January. Sarah is also leading the social impact campaign for Lakota Nation versus United States. Sarah. So I'll start out with a few questions. And, uh, but we will be taking questions from the audience. I think somebody's going to be uh, roving, hopefully, with a microphone. Uh, so after a few questions, we'll, uh, we'll kick it out to the audience. Uh, so first one is to you, Jesse. How did you get uh, started with this film? How did you get involved with this project? Yeah, um, on this project, you know, um, uh, initially, um, one of our producers, uh, his name's Ben, um, some years ago, he was reading an uh, article about the, the Black Hills uh, court case. And that sort of triggered a curiosity for more information. And I was living in Santa Fe at the time. And uh, I got a call. And he wanted to talk about the Black Hills. And I knew growing up, back home that that was a sensitive subject for people and that there were people that um, were better uh, better equipped to uh, tell that story. So I, I was a little bit, um, didn't feel that I had a, a any place to say anything about anything or even participate in anything of that nature. But. So it was a little bit contentious in the beginning when I was speaking with Ben. I was like, ah, I don't know. But the more that I sat with it and thought about it, and, and I thought about his curiosity and, and how it made him do these things to try to reach out to somebody, and I thought, well, maybe there's something I could help with this, and, and maybe I could try to... Maybe there's other people that would be interested in this story like he was. And so that's how I got, got started was uh, one of our producers had it, you know, initial read that article and that article set things in motion. Sarah, same question for you. How did you become involved with the project and what has your role been with the film? So I meant executive producer on the film. And um, it's interesting because it's it's like whenever, and when anybody asks you like, how'd you become part of the film? I think that as Lakota, as native people, people probably automatically think like, we were like, yes, okay, we're in. <laughs> we were not automatically in. We were like, hold on, how are you gonna tell this story? And I think like for me, that was my first question. Like it wasn't an automatic, it was like, Wait, so you want to tell the story. How are you going to tell it? Are you going to be fair? Are you going to be balanced? Like, that was my main question. And before I would say yes, I mean, and I say this because I think, like, they were like, well, Mark Ruffalo said yes. I don't care. He's my friend. He's my buddy. But I don't care. <laughs> you know, I was like, so are you going to be fair and balanced? Like, that's my question. Because as Lakota people in the Black Hills, it's such a sacred 
history for us still that for us it was like no you need to be fair and balanced today like we need you to be to make sure you're telling all sides of the story and before i can get involved in this like that's where it needs to be so that's what it took for me to be involved and it took me probably two months and i and i say like mark ruffalo said yes before i did because that's what it took for them to convince me to say yes and for those who don't know mark ruffalo is the hulk <laughs> Um, so tell us about the impact campaign and how can people get involved? So we've been working on a website called blackhillsjustice.com. You can look it up. Hopefully it'll be live by Monday. It's been a whole process. Um, so for our social impact campaign, it's really about getting land back, but it's a very complicated, complex process because for us, there's been a lot of history where we've had like non-native people come in, sort of parachute in and say like, Oh, we can help you. Like, let's all get the Black Hills back. And it's it's very complex. We have, it's Ocheri Shakonwi. We've been fighting this for like decades and decades and decades. And so it's not an easy fix. And actually like for us, it's, we need to be led by like our tribal leaders and for our, by our treaty council leaders and our elders that we're also very aware and cognizant of the fact that like we need to follow their lead. So for us, we've been supporting their efforts to get coordinated and organized behind getting land back. And that can look a lot of different ways. Um, it can be an executive order by the, by the presidential administration. And I say that specifically because it's not just tied to Biden. This is gonna be more, it could be a decades long fight. It could be a bill that's introduced by Congress. Like that's another avenue for us. But all of this has to be approved by our tribal leaders. There's nowhere that this goes without our tribal leaders. So for us, it's, it's been more of a, let's all get on board to support our tribal leaders and see what that looks like. And this film, we're very excited about because we think that it's educating a lot of our own young people, as well as non-Indians, about like what that history looks like from a Lakota perspective and how we can actually get the Black Hills back. And so that's something that is very special to us and very, very important in this film. Jesse, you, I think, did a masterful job of fitting a lot into the film, um, history up to present day. Um, when you're editing a film, uh, you take a lot of material that was shot um, and you try to chop it down and tell the story that you want to tell. I'm always curious, though, about the stuff that was kind of left on the cutting room floor. Is there anything that didn't make it into the film that still kind of nags at you a little bit? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's really a credit to uh, my co-director, uh, Laura Tomaselli. You know, um, I don't have a very extensive background in film, um, but like... I, in my intro, you know, I, I have been around storytellers my whole life. And and Laura and I, once we kind of clicked and, and discovered that we were on the same page with one another, we knew that we had an immense amount of um, ground that we needed to cover for the viewer because uh, overwhelmingly there is still a large majority of United States population that doesn't have no bearing or entry point into not only, um, you know, uh, Lakota history, but other indigenous uh, nations and their histories that they have. So um, it, it was very difficult um, because obviously not only, um, you know, we're, we're talking about are people under uh, bloodshed, under warfare. And then from that time, there has always been a generation of people uh, who've carried on uh, this document of the treaty and tried to keep the United States to keep that in high regard. So it's an amount, immense story. 
And we can't ever do justice to that because some of those faces we'll never know. We'll never know who they are. Uh, they're long gone. But I, I think that what it all boils down to, we wanted to try and at least cover some fundamental things and, and then try to, so, so when I say fundamental, I mean like there's little big horn. Um, there's a boarding school kind of coming into more of the national consciousness. Um, so try to give uh, some people and then try to uh, explain how uh, a treaty isn't just an antique. It just isn't a scrap of paper. It isn't a napkin, you know, it isn't, it, just, it isn't, isn't just some thing, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very coveted document that uh, is bound to the United States. And we have that. And we have people that hold it. So if we could try to at least cover a little bit of something from the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota people, um, at least give something an entry point. And obviously there's more to the story. Thank you, Jesse. Um, we can take a couple of questions. Um, if anybody in the audience, I see a hand over here. Is someone able to, uh, there we go. Fantastic, thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for the film, it was uh, terrific. Um, my question is about the, um, the, first of all, is the Black Hills, is it um, a national park or any kind of federal land? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of parts of the Black Hills. I mean, right. it's there's parts that are federal land. There's parts that are National Forest Service. Like there's oh. there's a lot of okay. parts so of the Black Hills. Okay. So I'll just ask the question, then you can work around that. Yeah. Um, reality. I'm um, citizen of the Confederated Salish and Flathead Nation in Montana. And um, one of the things that we had a huge chunk of reservation from 18, 1855, the Hellgate Treaty. Allotment hit the Salish in 1904, and so um, it was, land was just taken, and now it's a resort area, and it's very expensive land. But the Salish have been slowly buying back land mm -hmm. from, you know, whoever's selling it. Um, not in anyone's lifetimes, maybe in some generations, they'll have it all back. I'm just curious if um, getting the Black Hills back is something that buying it back piece by piece is something that the um, Dakota are working on. You know, you know, um, one time uh, I was working uh, for Sarah's partner, uh, Kevin, uh, uh, in the Oglala Sioux Tribe President's office. And this lady called me up one time. She called me up, um, older, older person. And she goes, hey, I got all this land here in the Black Hills. I want you guys to buy it because I think it's yours. And and I I, I was like, well, I'll, I'll tell Kevin, see what he says about that. <laughs> um, so it, it uh, yes, the 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 purchasing of land has always come up. Uh, there's uh, any time any time there's any bit of land that ever comes up in the Black Hills or surrounding area. Our, our, our tribes know about it. They're very much aware. They know of the asking price. And sometimes they even jump into it if they feel it's most, it's really important that they got to do it. Uh, I think Pesh Law is an example of that, where tribes have come together to save a, a piece of land from a commercial uh, development. Uh, fundamentally. Um, and yeah. we have to back up. We can't just say, and Peshla happened. Peshla was a piece of land that was actually historically, I mean, all of the Black Hills was ours, right, by treaty rights. And um, when Peshla happened, it was a piece of land that went up for sale for $6 million. And it was land that was actually originally ours, legally, by treaty right. It's our land. And it went up for sale for $6 million. And then when they found out that the tribes were interested in that land, 
it went up to $9 million. And so tribes had to organize to try to purchase that land back. That's our land with artifacts that are sacred, 10,000 years old artifacts that were located in that land that were ours. And so we had to purchase that land, and we did. We were, we were organized, we were fortunate that we have tribes that are able to do that. We, we purchased that land. <laughs> and, um, and so we know what it's like to purchase land back. And we are some of the poorest tribes, communities, counties in the United States. Top, we're always in the top 15 counties in the United States are the poorest counties. I mean, that's not a badge to like be proud of, but that's who we are. And that's what we had to come up with in order to buy back the land that is actually ours legally. So we're very aware of what it takes to purchase back land. And that's part of the social impact campaign is that making people aware of this history because a lot of people aren't because it was left out of history books on purpose. The propaganda in the United States, this was all on purpose. Cartoons, are you kidding? Like all of it, you, you think back about it. And I, I say this because um, I worked for the Episcopal Church for over a decade on the staff of the presiding bishop, um, Catherine Jeffers Shorey, and the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery. This is something that I studied, I worked on, I educated people about for over a decade. And so this is knowledge that I hold really dear. And when we're talking about like Native American boarding schools, which is in the film that we touch on a little bit, right? This is history that is all of our history. It's not just Native American history. This is everybody's history in the United States and we were all lied to. And so this film is something that is educating all of us about something that we all need to know about and also are responsible for. This isn't just like our job to fight for this land back. It's not, it's everybody's job to fight for this land back. The Black Hills in general were sacred to the Lakota people of the Ochati Shakoi. It was somewhere that we went to pray for, like pray at our sundances, our, everything was held there. But Peshla in particular held a lot of um, historical artifacts. So we can date it back 10,000 years of historical artifacts that are actually Lakota. So sacred to our people. So we know that that was our land <laughs> beyond like what anybody ever says. Like we know that that was our land. Where is it? It's in the middle of Black Hills. And it's really interesting because, um, you know, um, Chesapa is at, like one of the translations of the word is actually the heart of everything that is. And Peshla is actually, if you look at it from a satellite view of like the space, it actually looks like a human heart. And that's actually Peshla. It's a plains area in the middle of the Black Hills that is shaped like a human heart. That's called, you know, the heart of everything, everything that is and Chesapa. Hi, I'm, I'm really interested in just the different um, First Nations people and tribes working together and, you know, you know, unite as much as possible just for powers and number, power and numbers. And I'm curious if and how you've worked with other tribal initiatives and protests and what, whatever right now, either getting insight from them or sharing what your successes have been with others and just the information exchange factor? Yeah, yeah. I, I would say one one thing that would be kind of unique in this uh, regard is um, w there's there seems to be a movement um, to try to bring the Ocheti Shakoin governance structure back into the fold. And so when you look at, like, say, Oglala, uh, Pine Ridge, you look at uh, Cheyenne River, each are their own independent nation. Uh, and, and the United States government did a good job of making us competitive against one another. So that also breeds animosity. 
But prior to that time, we were very uh, good at in interlocking with each other to build a stronger confederation. And it was it moved very seamlessly. So uh, when you look at Oglala, that's just one piece. Uh, there's Standing Rock, there's seven. Now, um, a lot of indigenous nations have ties to the Black Hills. Um, you know, uh, Kiowa, Northern Cheyenne, Southern Cheyenne. Um, there's a whole number of tribes that um, also have ties to the region. And, and, I, and I think that it, it is smart to try to build, you know, uh, a broader, um, you know, sort of allyship around that. Um, but I think that if we can move towards getting the Ocheti shot coin and, and getting them uh, uh, linked together again, um, that would be a really big first step. I just, just adding on to what that gentleman had asked about, what is the U.S. government, what is their position at the point that the Lakota said, no, we don't want the money, we want the land? Kind of what happened at, on, at the government level? I mean, I would say we're still at the place of beginning that conversation, to be honest, because um, the Bradley Bill historically that went up to the Supreme Court that was talked about in the film, um, that piece of it actually not everybody agreed with. And, you know, the judgment that came down, we didn't take the money, right? So we didn't take the $100 million. Our tribes didn't take the $100 million. First of all, because the Black Hills are not for sale. Um, but I also say, like, personally, I'm all, we're also, like, smart enough to know that that constitutes a sale. Like, we take the money, that's a sale. We're smart enough to know that, right? So we never took the money. <laughs> and, um, and our people are very united in that, in that sense. We might disagree in a lot of other things, but, like, but that piece of it, like we're very like, no, we all agree. And um, right now, it, it's really about us following the lead of our tribal leaders, our treaty councils, our respected elders. And for us, a social impact campaign is about that. So we're not trying to say we're going to be the saviors. We're going to allow some parachute people to come in and say, oh, we're going to save all of you. Like, let's just figure this out and come up with an executive order because this actually has to be led by our people. And the Bradley Bill was not led by our people. So even pieces of that were not something that was tribal led. It was not led by our people. So our people actually need to be coordinated and that's going to take time. And it's a very fragile, complicated part of what it takes to actually organize within multiple treaty councils, tribal councils, elders. So we're not trying to get in the middle of it and complicate it whatsoever. We want to support, amplify, do what we can to inspire that movement to happen that we all want to see as, you know, the seventh generation that want our Black Hills back, but we're also very aware that it's going to be, it could be a longer process and everybody needs to be aligned with that and be supportive of it and be patient with that. Okay, we have, oh, oh, just to add on to that real quick, you know, I think a lot of times in uh, this day and age, you know, it seems like uh, you could throw money at something, you know, if me and this gentleman over here have a problem, a disagreement in between, we could throw money at each other all day. And and I think that I first thought, oh, that's shocking that the Lakotas don't want the money because everybody takes the money. But on the second time when I hear Phyllis talk and stuff, the, the meager amount that they tried to give us, that was very insulting. And they should have known that. And I, you can't tell me that they didn't know it was insulting. But they tried to dangle that little piece of cheese in front of us and think that we'd hop on it, you know. But like Sarah said, you know, we knew, you know. Pennies on the dollar. First of all, I want to say that movie was very moving, very, very moving and very well done. 
And I lived in the Black Hills for 32 years. And it just occurs to me as I'm watching it, some of the most important people to see that are the people that live in the Black Hills. And I was just wondering, what are your chances are having that be shown, you know, worldwide in the Black Hills, like, so people can really get it? We've actually shown it actually twice already in Rapid City, South Dakota, and it, it will be in theaters mid-July. So we have shown it in the Black Hills. Um, I, I think that it is important actually for the people of South Dakota to see it. Um, but we can't force people to watch the movie, right? <laughs> we can tell them it's very important for them to watch the movie. Um, but obviously in South Dakota, we're having a hard time with critical race theory and, and all of that. So, you know, um, there's a lot of hoops that we have to jump through to actually get to that point. And I think that um, we're working on that and making sure that the film is shown in all of the places of the Ocheti Shakoi, and that's part of the social impact campaign as well. And so, and then when the film goes, it'll be in theaters mid-July, and then it'll be on Hulu after that in the late fall. So yeah, we're very proud of that fact. Yeah, and, and could I add one more thing to that? You know, on my mom's side of the family, you know, she come from uh, settlers that uh, benefited uh, the Dawes Act. And there is a little bit of a, a worry in the back of my mind for everybody that is part of this film, whether they're the fa faces or they're like behind the scenes, um, Sarah, Kev, that there is a, a potential for danger uh, because this is a hard pill to swallow. And, and I do worry about that because obviously uh, people such as yourself, you know, come and they, oh, I'll at least listen and I'll at least try to learn, even if I don't understand. But there's some that already have their minds made up. They already have it figured out and they have, they, they, and, they, and they, like, they like us kicking dirt in our face, you know. And that's going to be the hard ones to try to, try to um, say, can you at least try to, like, think in a different way. So I do fear about that. Even even now, I still think about it. And it's true. I, I think that, you know, I grew up in South Dakota on the reservation and then moved after college and um, worked around different urban areas and most mostly in like Southern California and then moved back during COVID. And I would say during COVID, I was sort of shocked at the blatant racism in South Dakota, shocked. I think that I had hoped that it got better. I hoped that people were more educated. I, I hoped a lot of things. And I think I was mo I was so shocked at just how, how many times I was yelled at for just doing regular things, like putting up a tent, parking a car, shopping, picking up food. It was just, it like, I was just shocked at the blatant racism. So it's true. It's not, you know, this, we, we, you can watch this film and say like, oh, it's so easy. Like, why don't you just convince everybody to, you know, but no, it, it is something that is very serious. And, and it's something that there's a lot of education and pieces to it that people don't want to learn. They don't want to understand. There is no um, willingness to enter that conversation. But at the same time, it's very important for our own people to know. And I think that doing screenings in places like Cheyenne River, Sioux Tribe with um, Mark Ruffalo and, and seeing the young people come forward. And, and part of it is, for me, it was like, okay, young people, get back in the movie theater. Like, yes, it's cool. You got a selfie with the Hulk. But like, go back in the theater. Like, this is going to be up to you next. So, like, you, you have to take on this fight. You need to learn this history, right? You need to know. And I think that's part of us being able to tell our history and our story for the first time ever, quite honestly, ever, from a Lakota perspective of this is actually what happened with the Black Hills. This is our relationship to the Black Hills because um, the spirituality, that tie, the sacredness to that tie has never been told. And the only way that you can tell it is really through narrative, through film, because we are very experiential teachers, 
And so we don't tell you, we show you. And so this film is a way of us showing you that relationship with Hesapa. And thank you both for telling that story. Thank you, guys.